Right, hello, welcome to Probability, and this is the first lesson on this chapter, and it covers the first two worksheets, um, so that's the one that looks like what you can see on the screen now, on Basic of Probability, and there's another one on Venn Diagrams. So, let's get started. So you've got to learn some vocabulary, okay? An experiment is something that you can do again and again and again, and it gives you a number of possible outcomes. So, for example, if we were to roll a fair die, the outcomes, as you know, are one, two, three, four, five, or six. Okay, so those are outcomes. Now, slightly different is an event, which could be just one outcome, or it could be a set of outcomes. So the example I'm giving here is rolling a prime number, and that combines several outcomes. It combines the outcomes of getting a two, a three, or a five. Um, and finally, a sample space, a last definition, that's just a set of all the possible outcomes. Okay, now we'll see in a minute that can be represented by a table or in other ways. Um, but in an example such as this, we can just use a simple, straightforward list of the outcomes. So one, two, three, four, five, and six, as a little set there, those are our outcomes. <clears throat> now, we can use this formula that you can see here, the probability of something happening if the number of outcomes that correspond to that event divide by the total number of outcomes, but only if the outcomes are all equally likely. And I'm going to use a trivial example now to show that this isn't always the case. So example one, we've got a fair die. What's the probability of getting a five? Well, it's the number of ways of getting a five divided by the number of possible outcomes. So there's one way of getting a five. There's only one that goes on the top. And there are six possible outcomes when you roll a fair die. So one divided by six. Uh, for the probability of getting a prime number, so part B, well, we just have to know how many ways are there to get a prime number. And, well, there's two, three, or five. They're my three prime numbers that I can get when I roll a die. So three options out of six leads to a probability of a half. Right, here comes the trivial example. A weather elf, whatever that is, goes outside to record whether it's sunny or cloudy. What's the probability that it's cloudy? Now the idea is we don't have any idea. We can't use this kind of probability to work that out. Because the two events that we've got, it being sunny or it being cloudy, they're not equally likely. And just remember from this that if you've got two outcomes, it doesn't mean that they're equally likely. It doesn't mean you can say, well, one has a probability of a half and so does the other. In this case, probably more likely, let's be fair, that in the UK it's going to be cloudy. So the probability that cloudy is not a half. In general, don't assume that you can apply this sort of maths unless you know the outcomes are equally likely. Right, moving on to spinners. Man, uh, examiners love spinners and things like that. And we've got two of them here. Each one has four numbers on it, one, two, three, four. They are fair spinners. That means the outcomes are equally likely. And we spin them both and we add the values together, we find the sum. Um, so we want to work out various probabilities. The first thing that we do is draw this sample space. Now before we had a sample space that was a list, in this case we have this, basically it's a table really, isn't it, or a grid, and it does list my outcomes but it just doesn't, it does it in a different way. Okay, so I know that I can get one to four on my first spinner, one to four on my second spinner. So if I imagine combining all those to fill in the 16 different options in this grid, those are my 16 outcomes. Okay, if I get a three on spinner one and a four on spinner two, that gives me the seven there. So, 16 outcomes. What's the probability of getting exactly a five? Well, I'm circling them now. There's one, two, three, four ways that this can happen. Okay, so out of all my 16 options, four of them correspond to this event. So my probability is simply the number of ways I can get a five, which is four, we've just seen that, divided by the total number of outcomes, which is 16. And that simplifies nicely down to a quarter. Very similarly, if I want to know the probability of the sum being more than five, I just have to work out from my grid which outcomes correspond to this and these are the ones with the squares around them. Note of course that 5 is not more than 5 so I'm not including that. So there are six ways in which the sum can be more than 5. So my probability of getting more than 5 is 6 divided by the total number of outcomes, 16. And again we simplify that down to 3 eighths. Uh, 
Okay, here we go with Venn diagrams. These, it says, are extremely useful. They are, they're absolutely invaluable. They're brilliant and we use them to help us understand probability and to visualize what's going on. So you've got a rectangle for any uh, experiment. You have a rectangle and the whole thing represents the sample space, everything that can happen. And we draw these loops inside to represent events. So the loop O here represents the event that we get an odd number when we roll a die. And the event P represents getting a number greater than three. Now we can fill in the Venn diagram by considering how many outcomes go in each category. Now I've put a one there because there's only one way to get a number that's odd and greater than three. But the two means there are two numbers that are just odd but not greater than three. The other two is because there are two numbers which are greater than three but not odd. And the one represents num the one number which doesn't fit into any of those categories. Okay, can you think of which one that is? I'll leave you to figure out which one which ones are which, check that you agree with those numbers. Now we have this notation. Okay, you have to learn this notation for A intersection B. Um, some people think of it as and. You need to learn the word intersection, but it basically means both the events occur. So the probability of A intersection B can be represented on a Venn diagram by thinking about uh, the bit where they overlap. Okay, this little bit in the middle that I'm shading, that corresponds to a occurring because it's inside the loop for A, but B also occurring because it's inside the loop for B. Now this next bit, A union B, this is when either A happens or B happens or both. It's kind of weird to remember it that way, but if we draw it on a Venn diagram, we can visualize it. Okay, so if A happens, that's that bit, or B happens, that's that bit, or both happen, that's the middle bit. So actually the whole of the bit that's inside that sort of funny lying down figure of eight shape is included. Right, event A dash, that is pronounced not A, or the complement of A. Okay, so if you see the probability of not A, that's just the event in which outcome A does not occur. Okay, so that's quite easy to draw on our Venn diagram again. Um, draw a loop for A and a loop for B. And well, we can shade everything which is outside of the loop for A. Okay, sorry, this takes me a little while. So it includes part of B. Okay, so you can see it's going through B, but not the whole of B, because part there's a little bit that overlaps them both, and we don't want to include that because A does not occur. Um, right, the last one, A intersection not B. Okay, so that's basically the region that represents the probability of A occurring, but B not occurring. So if we look at the Venn diagram, we've got our loops for A and B once again. And I'll try and show this as carefully as I can, but it's not going to be great. Let's see. So A occurs, so I'm in that bit, but I haven't shaded the overlap because B does not occur. Okay, so it's just that sort of crescent moon shape on the left. A intersection, not B. Now, Venn diagrams are great for actually answering questions. So we've got 52 cards in a pack, and A is the event that we get an ace, D is the event that we get a diamond when we pick a card at random. So to understand this, let's draw a Venn diagram. Okay, so the first circle represents a uh, probability of getting ace, second is a diamond. Now we can fill this in bit by bit. So to do that, we actually think about what these events mean and what the different regions correspond to. Starting with the bit in the middle, the overlap is when the card is an ace and a diamond. There's one ace of diamonds, so we put a one there. And we gradually fill it in. There are three aces that aren't diamonds. There are 12 diamonds that aren't aces. So we filled in each part of the loop. And the bit around the outside is just as important. Those are the bits that aren't aces or diamonds. And we simply work out what goes there by subtraction, 52 cards in a pack, minus the other ones that we've already accounted for. So let's try and use this. Probability of A intersection D, that means the probability that it's an ace and it's a diamond. Well, we can see that's the middle bit, the overlap. There's only one of those, so one out of 52. And that means, in this case, the ace of diamonds. Part B, probability of A union D, that means A or D or both. 
so it's an ace or a diamond or it's both so we add up the three regions there 3 plus 1 plus 12 divide by the total which is 52 16 over 52 and that simplifies to 4 thirteenths so as I said that corresponds to it either being an ace or a diamond or indeed both and so the next one probability of not a okay so we have to add up the regions which are not a um, and that includes the 12 cards which are diamonds but not an ace and the 36 cards which are neither ace nor diamonds so 12 plus 36 out of 52 well that equals 48 and that can be simplified um, down to 12 thirteenths have a think about what the other way would be to calculate that you might find it simpler if the probability of getting not a you can think of that as being 1 minus the probability of getting a so 1 minus the probability of getting an ace um, okay for part D the probability of not a intersection D that means it's not an ace but it is a diamond okay so actually fairly straightforward it looks nasty but there are 12 cards we can see from the diagram which are diamonds but they're not aces okay so this corresponds to any diamond except the ace and last but not least um, this example is quite typical of exam questions and it requires a slightly different looking Venn diagram. We've got all this information, quite disparate facts about this survey of clients of a particular vet. Some of them own dogs, some own cats, some own fish, and there are some who own combinations. And for example, the 25 who own dogs, that's the first fact we've got. We don't know from looking at that whether uh, some of them also own fish, all of them also own fish, or none of them also own fish, for example. Now the Venn diagram lets us work out all these little bits and pieces or what all the different combinations are using the facts we're given. So draw it out, make sure that they all overlap and in the centre you've got an overlap from all three regions representing cats, dogs and fish and we work out from the centre. So this, the fact that corresponds to the centre is this one. Seven people owned dogs, cats and fish. So you put a seven bang in the middle and you work out from there by subtraction. So the next fact, 11 own dogs and fish. Well, over those 11, 7 are already on this diagram. So subtract 7 from 11. That's 4 of them who own dogs, fish, but not cats. Next, 10 own cats and fish. So of those 10, 7 already on the diagram. So we subtract 7 and get the 3. 15 own dogs and cats. 7 from 15 is 8, and so on. You might need to replay this a couple of times, but once you get it, you'll see that it's fairly straightforward. And for the outside regions, well, 25 own dogs, as we can see, um, but 8, 7, and 4 of those are already on this diagram. So subtract those three things from 25, we're left with 6 who just own dogs and no cats or fish. Right, 40 own fish in total. So subtract from that 40 the 3, 7, and 4, which are already on my diagram, and that tells us how many people just own fish, 26 of them. Finally, 53 own cats. Well, of those, 8, 7, and 3 are already on my diagram. So subtract those, 8, 7, and 3 from 53. That tells me how many people just own cats, 35 of them, and they don't own dogs or fish. And don't forget the last bit of information, which is the number that goes in your sample space. There were 100 clients altogether. If you subtract all the numbers in your diagram, which I'm not going to write out here, being a bit lazy, if you subtract all those numbers in the middle from 100, that tells you how many clients didn't own cats, dogs, or fish, 11 of them. So we can now get on with answering our questions. So part A, the probability that a client owns dogs only. Well, the dog only region of my diagram is that 6 that we worked out. So 6 out of 100, which simplifies down to 3 fiftieths. Part B, the probability that they own at least two different species of pet out of cats, dogs and fish. So that includes, well let's see, uh, cats and dogs, it includes cats and fish, and it includes dogs and fish. But also this last bit, don't forget, it includes cats, dogs and fish. So we need to count all the regions that correspond to more than or equal to two species. And when we do that, it simplifies down to 11 fiftieths. 
Okay, that's probability, uh, the first part in 15 minutes. Hope you enjoyed it. Replay it as many times as you like. See you later.